June of 2023, audiences around the world dared to ask the question, would I rather watch a silly pink comedy or a gritty dark historical drama? The answer was a resounding yes. October 20th, 2023, Mario and Spider-Man hit consoles and gamers dared to ask a similar question. Wait, if I own a PlayStation 5, can I really afford a Switch 2? I ain't got no DuckTales money vault. Today, we're gonna answer that relatively recent question. Hey, Mario and Spider-Man 2 just came out on the same day. Which should I play first? Most of us gamers have had this implicit understanding for a while that both of these games are going to be good. Mario, because I mean, duh, and Spider-Man 2, because it's just the first game and the first game was great, but now there's more and you could fly now. They fly now. And yeah, I know these games came out a month ago, but this isn't my real job. I don't make any money doing this. Stop yelling at me. In the same fashion, everyone sort of knew that Barbie and Oppenheimer were going to be good due to the fantastic directors, cast, filmographers, editors, whatever. It takes a village to raise a movie baby. You might be a right winger that hated Barbie because feminism or whatever, or a normie who can't appreciate Oppenheimer's cinema. And while I have individual arguments to yell at both of these groups, especially you, I'll just assume you agree that both of these movies are good. If you don't, you probably haven't seen them and you're wrong, but you're allowed to have your opinion that in my opinion is wrong, scientifically speaking. So let's go ahead and put both of these games in the ring together and see which one makes it out at the end of 10 minutes. Hey, that's like a Spider-Man reference or something. Huh, that's pretty cool. Hey, maybe we should reference the Mario movie. That might be fun. Oh God, not that one. No, no, no. Okay, Mario Side Scrollers. We all know how this works, right? You move from that direction to that direction. You jump, get power-ups, and rage that you can't speed run it like Cosmic Cheese or Small Lamp. Repeat. So why are we even bothering talking about this if we all kind of understand how these games work? Well, it's because Mario Wonder does something that I genuinely didn't think was possible anymore. It made a 2D Mario fun again. Maybe I'm just old as sin, but I wasn't particularly tickled by the gameplay of New Super Mario Bros. Wii or Wii U or Luigi's Spaghetti Factory or whatever it's called, because I felt like they were just sleek, modern interpretations of what was already done well in the old days, like with something like Super Mario World. But Mario Wonder is not like that. The game is just oozing with new ideas and personality. Look at these new power-ups. I can be a big bubble blowing baby. I can be a drill burr and I can be a elephant. It's an olive oil. All the running, jumping, flying, bouncing, spinning, bop it, twist it, pull it, flick it. They're all fantastic. Mario, Luigi, Peach, Daisy, Toads, Yoshis, and this weirdo. Huh? There aren't any gameplay differences between the main five characters, so choose away and then give player two Yoshi so they won't die and ruin your time. Thanks, little sibling mode. The game also features delightful badges that feel like a healthy compromise between stuffy pit collectibles and modern game design mixed with the old school sensibilities of Mario. Orange badges affect your platforming, blue modifies the level it gives little boosts, and the special badges totally alter your mechanics. I love the parachute hat, the floaty jump, spin hop, and even the auto mushroom for those tougher levels, because sometimes they suck. Oh. One last quick note, I've seen a couple articles suggesting the lack of overall power-ups in favor of the Wonder Flowers transformation is a flaw, but I think that criticism is totally off base. The whole concept of this game is that the stages transform and you have to adapt. If the stages are boring and predictable, what's the point of having a bunch of power-ups? Those other opinions missed it. And I, I switched it. And also there are stickers for online collaboration, I guess. So that's fun. The only things that really suck about this game is that there's no true online multiplayer. Thanks Nintendo. We knew that was going to happen. And these sections where you're basically turned into a Goomba. I hate these. No game that feels this good and goes this fast should ever arbitrarily slow you down just to make some sort of stealth mission. Speaking of segues. Just like Mario, we all sort of know how Spider-Man games work and how it's supposed to make you feel like Spider-Man. So if you want to know my opinion on the baseline mechanics and the series in general, go watch my video on Spider-Man PS4. But take what you know about that, bury it in the yard. Number two has shifted into maximum, maximum overdrive. overdrive. Holy shit, oh my God, you can cross the bridges. Oh my God, oh my God, Miles got blasted and whoa, we're going back and <laughs> Bro, look at all these new combat options with the spider claws and the punching and boom. Ooh. Oof, these symbio punches hit hard. Oh look, I can still do stealth takedowns. Yeah! Chain combo. These attacks are way faster. <laughs> Zipping around corners and fun little search puzzles. Okay fam, I see you. Look how much more organic these puzzles are instead of feeling tacked on. Stealth missions with MJ, no! Oh wait, it's actually solid? So yeah, MJ's stealth missions are still here, but she gets to be more of a badass now, and there's fewer of them. So at least we got that going for us. Which is nice. 
In my critique of the first game, I talked about the stuffy pit of collectibles and how organically they were worked in, but how some of them and the side missions felt mostly tacked on. That's not the case here. Between the city tokens, tech parts, advanced tokens, whatever, there's less of them, and they're mostly earned through side missions, which are way more interesting overall, whether they be having some sort of narrative function or being the cool thing that Miles has to do with the instruments where you're basically helping preserve his culture. I love it. The only thing that really sucks about this game is just how much it focuses on Peter. Don't get me wrong, this is a superb story to focus on Peter for, but it leaves Miles really feeling in both story and gameplay, just like a Spider-Man B or whatever. And again, that side content is still really good, but you know, it all revolves around Peter and that can kind of be deflating. Also, why isn't this game co-op online or just co-op in general? I know logistically that's probably kind of a nightmare because it, it, of all the factors of making two people on screen work, but just think about how cool it would be to have one person doing a speed run with the Peter story and the other person doing a speed run with the Miles story and you have to meet up in the middle. <sighs> A boy can dream. So yeah, both of these have superb, dynamic gameplay, and you both get a gold star. I'm very proud of you both. Good job. But if I'm going to award a point, it's going to go to the game that has a few new ideas and generally feels like it's got a more cohesive vision for the overall gameplay feel. Plus, the piranha plant sing at me. <laughs> this one is going to be the closest by far, but I'm going to go ahead and give the plumber the point for gameplay. Thank you so much for playing in my game. If you didn't already know the story up until this point, Spider-Man 2 does this really cute before you even start the game recap from Yuri Lowenthal and Najee Jeter as Peter and Miles respectively, telling you about these two Spideys and where they were, how they got there, where the villains are. It's really endearing, they have great chemistry, I really appreciate it if you didn't already know where the game was. As for the story going on at large, there's a lot to talk about and we don't got time. So let's do a spoiler free speed run of this story and some of its highlights. All right, so we start with a fantastic opening sequence against Sandman laying waste to Manhattan and a great look into how Peter, Miles, MJ, and Genki are a big team working together. Love it. Peter and MJ are back together and trying to figure out if they're living in Aunt May's old place and Peter's trying to be a teacher because those that can't do teach. And OMG, Harry's back. Obviously the big villain here is Craven and whoa, he's hunting in New York. That's like a theme. And oh wow, Miles has to learn how to be Spider-Man the right way. Oh my God, themes aren't just for book reports. Go fuck around and find out stuff in Brooklyn and Manhattan with Sandman's memory or whatever, I feel like Hamlet when I'm holding these little skull memories. Ooh, now Peter and Harry are trying to save the world. And Miles has a little girlfriend. And what the hell, it's mini game time at Coney Island. What is the point of it? Oh, okay, I get it, Harry is and Oh my God, now we're at the foundry with Craven and these cultists and Wraith. Oh my God, Wraith is And the zoo with the stealth mission. Oh my God, Peter. And 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 but real quickly for anybody who hasn't played or seen the trailers break it down, this game revolves around the symbiote. And the last time we saw him in a non-comics format that was actually a pure Spider-Man story, oh sorry Venom, you're still special, was when Toby did this. We don't really talk about this. I feel like the symbiote, just like those flashbacks from earlier, is too often used as a crutch to make an angsty, edgy Spider-Man who doesn't want to save people no more. Oh, I'm so selfish and I stand alone. But this game doesn't do that. It's so genuinely compelling. Even in symbiote form, Peter is still helping people in crisis and it doesn't turn him into the selfish jerk. It just amplifies some of the negative feelings that he has during the story and you see him change slowly over time. It's so well written, 10 out of 10 for story and characters here. Also, just this side mission and the scene with this old man on the bench is really beautiful, and I think it might actually be my favorite moment of the entire game. It's a Mario side-scroller. Bowser turns into a giant Iron Maiden metal castle. You is a elephant, here's a flower bug. Moving on. Holy crap, look at all these cute animations. Look at these little elephant butts in the pipes. So adorable. And why are there wigglers wearing roller skates? I don't know, why aren't I? Piranha plants are singing, Goombas look shocked when they wake up from a nap, pipes are coming to life and moving, Bowser's awesome smoke trails with the cool outline and the shading. Look at this little jolly boy. I think you get it. Every single animation, color choice, and stage design aspect is scientifically formulated to tickle the underside of your fun receptors. I'm just overjoyed, even when it makes me rage, for example, 
hole after accidentally stumbling through a secret in the map into Hornland. Speaking of the map and the levels, let's do a quick roll call. Forest, ice, shiny water, desert, swamp, magma, jack black. There's nothing really surprising here. So how does the game mix it up to make it worth it? Trippin' balls. So yeah, Super Mario Wonder just has so much style, fun, and personality. The power-ups, the level design, the color schemes, the way that the Wonder Seeds or whatever turn every stage into an absolute fever dream. I feel so stimulated. But let's not forget about our boys over here. Is there any superhero, man or woman, that changes their outfit as much as Spider-Man does? Because, it, the, can, can someone find that out for me? Because, oh my god damn, look at these outfits! Wow, the icons on the map are a little more holographic, like when I'm looking for wind tunnels to glide on. Sweet! The icons by their names to differentiate the spiders, the way that the same person in each of Peter and Miles' phones are unique pictures that denote their relationship, just mwah. There's so much color and places to go throughout the city, right down to being able to run on a baseball diamond and then programming in Peter narrating a home run. That's attention to detail. That's understanding your audience's desire to explore and the characters doing it. And when it comes to exploring, it's never been more enjoyable. Whether jumping back and forth with that pseudo load timeless transfer between spiders, deciding whether to fly or swing, or forcing you to play the game and help individual burrows before you even unlock fast travel, the game's movement continues to impress. You don't re-unlock the same stuff from the first game. You start with most of the previous skills and then build more on top. Sure, it can be a little bit of a clusterfuck in terms of options, but everything is viable. And because the game is certainly faster and weightier all around, it gives you the freedom to experiment with all those viable options in any given scenario. But before I heap too much praise, I do want to criticize a couple of things. One, I'm not crazy about how the camera sometimes dynamically zooms in a little bit when you're in tighter areas. It's a great idea in principle, but it just makes me feel a little uncomfortable even with the motion blur off. Two, what the hell is up with this licensed music? Three, why do some characters look genuinely better animated than others? Because I don't want to shame Ben Jordan. He's doing a fine job. And I'm not just going to say I want John Bubniak back. Release the bub cut. But there's just something wrong with Ben's face on his body sometimes. And MJ too. I get that they probably wanted to age these characters up so the faces and the models had to change a little bit. But it's really distracting that it's in the uncanny valley when some characters like Miles just look consistently great the whole game through. Still, the game's got that drip, just like Mario. And between all the new suits and new abilities and the overall speed increase, it just feels like it's really established its identity, bringing these two games out to... Losers! Crap, we're gonna need a tiebreaker, aren't we? Uh, what else is important when it comes to buying games? Uh-oh. Welcome to the bonus round that no one would ever ask for, but this category is worth two whole points. Two. Let's not make a big deal out of this, but comparing these games is ultimately like choosing between apples and potatoes. You can't play Mario on PlayStation or vice versa for Spider-Man. And that means if you want to play both, you require both consoles, and that's a problem. As of November 2023, there have been approximately 132 million Switch sales in six years and 46.6 .6 million PlayStation 5 sales in three. And we all know how difficult PS5s have been to get in the first place, even this far into the console life cycle. Now, I do own both consoles, so I can say that I am very fortunate to not have to worry about this problem but many people do. I don't want to stand up here on my soapbox and preach too much, but we are literally living in a post-capitalist hellscape, at least here in America. Inflation is at one of its insane all-time highs. The supply chain has been horribly compromised by climate change. Purchasing a single family home, regardless of what state you live in, between two people even, requires you to have like six figures to be comfortable. And lastly, most importantly, wages across almost every single industry have been static for decades, and that hurts the working class more than it does anyone. In the middle of all this chaos, we as a people fail to afford comfort more and more often as time goes by. 
video games, as successful and profitable as they are, are one of the most expensive leisure time hobbies there is. Especially now that AAA games have raised their prices from 50 to 60, even $70 for the baseline game. But honestly, I don't even blame video game companies that much. Go watch Donkey's video. He explains it better than I will. So owning both of these consoles is already a big ask, right? And if you don't have either game yet and you only own one of these consoles, then this question and this video really are a moot point. PlayStation Bros will go get Spider-Man and Nintendo shills can stick to Mario. Capitalism be damned. Who cares what your recommendation is? But see, I'm gonna do something dumb. I'm gonna make a stand and die on a hill. So here's the thing, both Spider-Man and Mario are crazy fun to play. Their mechanics are the highest level of polish in the industry, and the teams at Nintendo and Insomniac are really just showing off their expertise. Both games have phenomenal style and creativity, with every little animation that Mario does just makes me smile, or every mid-air flip from Miles just giving me a rush. And yeah, it might look like at face value the story for Spider-Man pushes it over the top, and you should go out of your way to get a PS5 and play that first. But I'm personally going to recommend Super Mario Wonder over Spider-Man 2, even though both games are utterly fantastic and you should absolutely play both of them if you can. Mario Wonder just truly feels like Nintendo has hit the franchise reset button in the wake of Charles Martinet retiring, and the kind of fun and magic that it supplied me at least feels the same way that Odyssey did for 3 3D games. See, if you're going to dispose that vital income we were talking about, you want to make sure that you're making a good investment, even in a leisure time activity, because go ahead and try and buy a PS5 Pro. You won't. And even if you have a PS5, the demographic for that type of game and console is limited compared to something like Nintendo, even if the games might be better overall because they can be more mature and they can have a higher quality. I don't have to recommend Spider-Man 2 because statistically speaking, a PS5 owner already has Spider-Man 2 and is yelling me in the comments about not choosing using this masterpiece over Nintendo's masterpiece. And yeah, I get it. It's great. Go play it. I'm not stopping you. But getting and owning a PS5 and this game is going to be hard for most standard consumers. But you know what you can easily get? A Switch. You know who Mario is for? Everyone. This is going to be a lot of kids' first ever Mario game. And Damn, this is a good first Mario game for you to play. So yeah, both games are absolutely fantastic and you should absolutely go play both of them if you can. But I'm gonna recommend Barbie first. It's not that Oppenheimer is a bad game by any means and damn, does it have an engaging story. But Barbie is $10 less, it's easier to get a console, it's infinitely more replayable and you can be a elephant. I rest my case. made another video, you happy now?